Good morning, everyone, and welcome to Research Ed Home. Uh, this morning, we have Jude Hunton with us, uh, and we're delighted to have him with us. Uh, Jude uh, is no stranger to Research Ed, as he is the fantastic organiser of Research Ed Rugby uh, that has been running for a few years now. Unfortunately, this year, we we had to make a little change of plans. Um, but uh, Jude is an English teacher, uh, but he's also, he's, he's uh, had many leadership roles and at the moment he's trust-wide vice principal of the Trust Is At. Um, so an exciting role. And this morning is going to be talking to us about curriculum, um, about implementation of the curriculum and how to make it as effective as we can so that the kids learn as much as they can. So I'm going to pass it on to Jude now. Jude, if you're ready. Okay. Thank you, Helen. Let me just switch my screen. Yeah. Perfect. Hello, everybody. Thank you for joining me. Uh, my name is Jude Hunton. As Helen said, I'm currently uh, an English teacher and the secondary. Um, Vice Principal at um, David, Rogers, David Ross Education Trust. I'm going to talk to you today about um, chunking and I'm hopefully going to um, make you look on it uh, in a fresh way. Um, my presentation is called Chunk It, Don't Flunk It because I want you to consider the way that a curriculum can be packaged up, sequenced, made into proximal chunks of knowledge which are then retrieved over time in the best possible way for students to remember it. I'm going to take you through some examples from different subjects, which was a really interesting challenge for me when I was designing this presentation, because as I say, I'm an English specialist. So I uh, definitely had to stand on the shoulders of others for the, the maths and the MFL. And I also um, brought in a very talented young English um, lead practitioner to help me um, keep me up to date really um, with the with the English um, example I'm going to give you. Uh, <clears throat> I do want to stress though that these are just examples. I know as teachers we're, we're very um, keen to bring our own creativity into the classroom um, and when I wanted to bring examples in here I didn't want to say this was the only way of doing it but I just want to show you an illustration really of what chunking could look like in these different subjects. And I'm hopeful it's useful for you as a specialist in one of those subjects, but also perhaps more than that even, as somebody who is looking to lead in a school um, going forward. So currently, there's a great deal of emphasis on how you lead the curriculum. It's a real challenge if you're leading a curriculum because you will have to have a view on subjects um, outside your own specialism. So that's what I'm, I'm hoping I can pull together for you today. So thank you for joining me and off we go. So here are some of the, um, the, the, the helpers I've got today. Um, uh, Jake Hunton, who yes, you'll notice is my brother and uh, he's the head of MFL. Um, Anthony Alonzi, who's head of maths. Um, and Sam Stewart, who is a English lead practitioner. Um, I've involved some of their thinking today. There are the, that's their um, Twitter handles if you want to carry on the conversation afterwards with them. Right, so I'd like to just um, present some principles to you that will inform this presentation. Firstly, that knowledge is both a goal and a means. And we're going to look at that in a couple of slides time, what that really means. Um, it's our intent to make sure that school curricula are efficient and memorable. We, we're all desperately scrabbling for time, aren't we, in school? Desperate to make sure that our subjects get more and more time. Wouldn't it be wonderful if we could find ways of making that time count double or triple or, or really, really um, uh, sort of max out to, 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 to mind hack what the students are able to, to cover. Um, so that's what we want. My assertion is that to be able to achieve that, we want a chunked curriculum. Now that has implications, mainly um, that Chunking perhaps is a bit different from what we first think and that chunking is different in different subjects because every subject has um, a different way of arranging knowledge, of being composed of knowledge. So lots of sort of complex issues. Our main idea is chunking. 
Chunking is about increasing the ability for students to be able to learn effectively and efficiently. However, it, it's different across different subjects. Right, so I'm gonna take you through a little kind of um, survey, really. Um, um, and, uh, uh, fascinating for those of you like me who are addicted to the changing world of education and particularly the exciting, um, you know, fantastic changes we've had over the last few years. So here's a tweet that um, zoomed around the world, um, retweeted by a really brilliant um, school leader, Andrew Percival, who if you don't follow, you should, um, he's amazing. Um, and he's retweeted there, uh, I think about a year or two ago about um, Dylan William, leading the charge on why knowledge is important, why a curriculum based on knowledge is much more important than a skills curriculum. and. Um, if you're as sort of as old as me, you've been in teaching for as long as me, you, you may have been through an iteration of school life where skills were at, at the forefront. Um, I have been, I, I, I found it quite, quite disappointing in the kind of gains you saw for students. So this is all very exciting to me. And then you can read wonderful educationists and thinkers like David Didow there, who talks about knowledge as a goal. And he explains it as saying that Children need powerful knowledge to understand and interpret the world. Without it, they remain dependent upon those who have it. So it's fair and just that all children should have access to knowledge. Powerful knowledge opens doors and it must be available to children. Um, and if you, you know, if you want to follow any of that up, I would really strongly recommend um, David's book um, about making kids cleverer. That's it's a wonderful moral and intellectual book on, on the importance of knowledge. Anyway. That's how we look at knowledge as a goal. But then there's also the second reason for why we have knowledge at the forefront in our curriculum, because knowledge is a means. Knowledge is a means to be an even better learner. So, you know, push away all of that sort of nonsense of learn to learn over the last sort of 15 years. And remember that knowledge enables. The key, um, the key sort of, uh, touchstone for that was the great popularity over the past few years people have had for as well as um, cognitive load theory as another Dylan William tweet um, a slide I took from an Ofsted um, training session about a year ago about the the, the way they were using the um, definition for learning based around the long-term memory and it might be a bit obscured for you on the screen there, I apologise for that, but Sweller's really useful quote about knowledge being crucial because it, it's it creates, it frees up the ability in the working memory to be able to think fundamentally because the working memory is a bottleneck. I'm gonna assume that you might know a lot of this already, but it's helpful for where we're, where, where we're headed today. So, <clears throat> to summarize, knowledge is an enabler. We can look at it as a goal. We can look at it as a means. And it's obviously then absolutely vital. As a means, a really useful, a useful metaphor that originally comes from Edie Hirsch is about knowledge being sticky. Um, <clears throat> the greater the challenge in a task, the more knowledge you have in your long-term memory, you're able to um, perform better in that task. And knowledge is a goal. Knowledge is something that where we can raise achievement, where we can address the gap. The, um, the Matthew effect is the most sort of helpful, popular metaphor for that, isn't it? The idea that if you are, if you come into education knowledge poor, you you remain knowledge poor, and the gap between you and your peers gets wider and wider unless we address it with um, the teaching of knowledge. So, we've got those ideas, and I don't think those are too revolutionary, really. It's hopefully it's a, that's a kind of summary of where we where we tend to be nowadays. So I want to say, to say that one goal of education and the means to becoming smarter is to idealistically integrate the entire curriculum into one cognitive element that's stored in the long-term memory. Yeah, that's idealistic. I think we, we teachers, we, you know, we, 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 we thrive on optimism, don't we? We need a lot of optimism. And then the typical question schools always ask then is, okay, how do I start? So, 
then we ask ourselves what tools what what do i have in my toolkit for teaching knowledge now this can go in two directions um, and i want to make the case that what what i'm going to show you here is if you like genericism's baseline the things that do work but they're problematic and we'll encounter those problems in a couple of slides down the road so quick helpful list on stuff that you can do as a teacher so the kind of the the range of, of teaching strategies that are known as generative learning um, Tom Needham's written a series of amazing blogs on this there's a lot of different strategies um, put down under the umbrella term generative learning that um, force students to select organize and integrate what they currently have in their long-term memory with what they're encountering in a learning experience task um, and this causes uh, more effective learning however i've put remember boundary conditions because not everything works well everywhere which is a, a theme we've started looking at and we and we're going to we're going to encounter in a bit more detail um a really really fabulous series of blogs by um george dublis um this one i picked out here on the link is where george talks about the importance of stories and he looks at stories in science which i had never thought about before and when you read that blog it's it's wonderful and what i like about george's blogs is he doesn't look from a, a solely sort of cog sci kind of not just a not just a cognitive science approach he's looking at knowledge as something that's personal that's about identity and that's 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 really interesting um but having said that there's a great deal of cognitive science that backs up the, the power of stories for making, making um, things memorable. The test effect, just, you know, the comes in different names, doesn't it? Like retrieval practice is the, sort of the most common one, but that's the, the, the most powerful generic approach, I would argue, for, um, for learning in the classroom with the most sort of solid research underpinning it. I've named three books I found very, very helpful in understanding this. Um, yes, I have put my brother's book in there as well. Um, but it's a good book. Uh, Retrieval Practice by uh, Kate Jones is fabulous. Um, Powerful Teaching uh, is a brilliant book. Absolutely brilliant. And I don't, um, I don't see it enough on Twitter, really. I think it's because it's sort of, it's an American book. But it's absolutely wonderful. And then there's Exam Literacy, which looks at different subjects and looks at how to use um, teaching methods of retrieval practice linked to those subjects. So that's very useful. Obviously, there's Lamov. I particularly like his transaction cost um, concept about making sure that the practices you use across a school are as simple and as uh, are replicated as much as possible, so you don't uh, you don't lose the opportunities that are that, that come about. So. Um, classroom routines are kind of made consistent and standardized across the school as an example and then there's elaboration but making it personal which you probably heard about typically as like the memory palace approach which I'm, is um, the best way of kind of remembering that generalized teaching actions so mini whiteboards wall whiteboards um pair grouped individual using technology um, oral and choral and written responses and then i've just put a very very simple summary of um like a rule of thumb for retrieval practice so um keeping it simple stupid so your knowledge with a cue or a context test on that with the cue and then next time with a space test again without that cue or without that context so you're building up um flexibility you're building up the kind of the the retrieval strength of that piece of knowledge so that's a really simple set of um approaches which i'm calling the baseline for genericism which has its place, but also has its problems, which I'm just going to talk about in a few slides time. Um, this is just to make sure we're all on the same page. I'm sure we're all really happy with the concept of retrieval practice it stems from very um, like classic research into the mind. So um, Ebbinghaus's forgetting curve was, was the first time I encountered it. I think. Um, this is a sort of model of that the forgetting curve being interrupted here in a series of different intervals um if that is new to you then i would recommend daisy kisaldulu's um research 
Ed Home blog at the start of this series where she, she explains this brilliantly. Um, and retrieval practice, the way I remember it, it's just about bringing information to mind, just getting it out there. And the concept behind it is you're, you're encouraging automatization. So those of you who drive, how many times have you got to work and you can't remember the actual journey that you've taken? And that's because of, it's because you're an expert, it's because you're an expert at driving. Um, and because of that expertise, it's become automatic to you and your mind's been able to sort of, you know, bubble about, well, all the different things you could think about before you get into work. So which child have I got to go and see? Which member of staff have I got to see? All that sort of stuff. So that's kind of straightforward, I think. Here I'm using a slide from um, one of David Dido's blogs on the journey from novice to expert. Another really helpful um, concept for learning, really useful as well in school, I find, when you're doing CPD and you're, you're helping lead change because it's, it's quite a straightforward idea, isn't it, the idea of a journey. The detail's important though. If you have a quick look in the column on experts, all grouped around knowledge. And if you just cast your eye down to the second from bottom, where David's written, um, an expert is less likely to experience cognitive overload as attention is buttressed by memorized chunks of knowledge. That's where we're sort of heading with this presentation. I know David's put uh, likey, sort of, you know, um, you know, likey and likey, but never mind, we'll ignore that. So, but please do follow that up if you've not seen that before. Now, I've got a quotation at the bottom of this screen saying, from the, a book called The Unified Learning Theory, which is an amazing book, which is going to inform the next few slides. And in that book, they talk about chunks underlying most development of expertise. So what does that mean? Well, what is chunking? Now, I, before I started putting this presentation together, my first understanding of chunking was that, oh, it's, it's to do with Rosenshine, it's to do with taking those small steps. And I remember as, as, a, as an early teacher, having some very useful advice about, well, okay, if you're bringing fresh information to class, chunk it, put it into, um, put it into a scaffold, break it down, take the students through it slowly. And that's, that's very good. That's, that's, I think that's good advice. But in this presentation, I want you to be able to, to see that chunking has its roots in cognitive science and it has to be filtered through the particular subject you teach or that you lead or you line manage for it to be really, really super effective for you to be able to accelerate the student's learning to be able to sort of hack, if you like, their, their working memory. So we look at that book there, The Unified Learning Model. We're gonna sort of swerve over to that text now. So the best way of looking at chunking is beyond just bits of the text. The, the topic, the content, the knowledge. Instead, it's about making um, connected groups of knowledge in, in the mind. And that's something that can only happen over time. So if we think about what we know about working memory, working memory is very limited, right? If we go back to Sweller's um, cognitive load theory about the, the bottleneck um, and research tends to say that we're really only capable of holding about four pieces of four pieces of information, four pieces, four pieces of knowledge at one time in our working memory. So the strain from being able to do real thinking, serious thinking, is taken up by long term. Now just in case you don't believe me and you're sitting there thinking, that's absolutely nonsense. I'm I've you know I'm I'm listening to you, Jude, I'm also on my phone at the same time and I'm thinking about what I'm making for tea tonight, then um, the, that multitasking you're doing is, is, is it's a myth because I'm going to show you why. So I've taken this thought experiment from the book we just looked at a second ago. So if you read those letters on the screen, have a quick look. Right, now we're going to take the letters away. How many can you remember? Not very many. I couldn't. No. And I actually thought, despite knowing all this, I thought I'd be able to do it. Yeah. Um, 
if you can, by the way, you are really unusual. Your, you, your, your brain is phenomenal. Um, go and hand yourself in somewhere to some scientists. Um, that that's, but generally speaking, most people should not be able to do that. And that's because of the phenomenon of the, the limited area of the working memory. So let's try it this way. So there's words on the screen there. Dog, farm, rocket, onion, frame, car, rodeo. What were the words? Now that should be easier, even though there were more letters being used. And the reason for that, as you know, you're way ahead of me here and you can see that as well is because there's meaning attached to those groupings of letters so what's happening is you're actually storing more letters in your mind but because you've attached a meaning to them because you've turned them well they have been turned they are chunks in your in your memory your long-term memory you can hold them better so what we've seen in that really simplistic example there is that if your working memory is able to chain it up able to create a corridor with your long-term memory just like we saw with the cognitive load theory that's effectively creating a chunk a chunk of meaning that expands your learn expands your memory and makes you able to learn to operate to pay attention which is what we want however that's incredibly complex to take that very straightforward idea isn't it and put it into the subject that you teach or lead or, or line manage because every subject has a different relationship with knowledge and the knowledge itself can be complex so let's start to address that issue shall we <clears throat> so let's just summarize what we've looked at there we know a chunk is a connected grouping of knowledge so a chunk is not just breaking up the course it's something in your mind that fuses together, that draws together a chain, a corridor, a, a linkage, a, 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 an entity of knowledge from that working memory to that long-term memory. Um, if you're able to think of a way of enabling that for, for a young person, for anybody, for yourself, for a young person, you're able to hack the ability for that, one, that working memory to, to, to function. Um, and this takes us back to the idea of knowledge <clears throat> as a means to enable better learning. So the, if you're increasing the amount of knowledge in your long-term memory, um, you're more effective as a, as a learner, as a, as a child to think. But as a teacher, as a practitioner, as a leader of, for young people, it's incumbent on us then to think about, well, what is the appropriate, powerful, sequential, proximal knowledge in our curricula that enables kids to go on this journey? And that's, that's the challenge we're all facing, isn't it? So, let's have a little think about how we might do that in three different subjects. Now, I watched a really great webinar. I think um, lockdown's been incredible for all of the different CPD that's out there. Um, it's when you get a chance away from doing online teaching and, and juggling school remotely, you, you then get a minute with a screen. Um, it's, it's been fantastic. And one of the best ones I've watched was from Ambition Institute called How to Teach Online. And there was a fantastic explanation of different of ways of looking at knowledge in different subjects. Um, it's a rule of thumb guide, and it only really frames the argument you're making, but it's useful to think about knowledge in subjects. Is it hierarchical or is it horizontal? Now, hierarchical means that if you like, as a, as a young person proceeds through the subject, um, and this is a rule of thumb, you know, a, a quick and rough explanation, there are a series of steps they must go through for them to get to the next point. Um, and the, for me, the, the classic example of that is maths. Maths has different branches, yes, but each of those branches has, is extremely hierarchicized. Um, and it's, it's almost it's, it's ruthless in the way that to be able to achieve in maths in those different topic areas one has to get a really good facility for that particular bit before you can move on to the next the next stage um, so in the next few slides we're going to look at a, a friend of mine head of maths uh, Anthony Alonzi who's going to talk you through a particular approach to maths 
um, <clears throat> taking account of how we want to chunk up knowledge, make knowledge link to the next stage, be that series of lessons, months or years. MFL is a fascinating one because as a subject, it changes quite profoundly as the student becomes more and more expert. If you look at MFL studied at university, all the way back to, uh, I don't know, stage three, it's, it's a, I would argue it goes from being quite hierarchized early on to becoming quite horizontal as you would reach undergraduate level, um, which, is, which is really a great illustration of this, this journey from novice, novice to expert. Um, what we're going to look at in a few slides time there is how chunking works um, in terms of recycling language that has, has high frequency and multi-use. Um, and then for English, my subject, the best phrase I can use for that is anarchic. It's not mine, I, I took that from um, Ruth Ashby Walker's um, writing on English, but it's, it's just sums it up, doesn't it? It's, it, is, it is cumulative, it, there are elements that are hierarchical, particularly early stage when you're trying to address grammar. Um, but as it goes on, especially in the way that a, the discipline becomes a school subject, it, it, is, it is bonkers, isn't it? It it's becomes a mix. Um, and in a, the next slide, I'm going to show you how I would um, address that in the school setting. So let's have a little look at some examples. And as I say, these are all worked examples to help you see my thinking on it. These are not the only way, the best way of doing it, it's an approach. And I hope it helps you in your thinking about, well, if I'm having conversations with somebody outside my subject area, we want to go through our aims, our, our intent, and how we're implementing it in, in, in light of that, and in light of what we know is the most effective way for students to, to learn. So, what could chunking look like in English? Now this is, I've had a lot of help from Sam Stewart here. You can just see his, his uh, Twitter profile above. So if you'd like to follow him afterwards and have a chat with him, he's, he's very good. Um, <clears throat> so, for example, in year seven, we'll be looking at Oliver Twist. So I'm going to give some examples of how I might approach stu the study of a certain section of knowledge, which helps understand Oliver Twist, but then I'm gonna talk about how that folds forward. So one approach, using a text and a high quality teacher explanation, students will be learning about the poor law and the, the, the limitations of the welfare state, if there even was a welfare state there really, arguably. Um, so three things I would want my students to learn. The, the lack of freedom, the attitudes to the poor in, in culture and society at that time, and the, the experience of the workhouse. So ways I could do that is I could get students to make it personal to them so they could compare the hours they spend in school to the hours children would be forced to, um, to work. Um, I could get students to reflect on a time when they felt that the treat, their treatment had been unfair and link that to a historical example of the way that the poor were treated. Um, and then for the workhouses as punishment, I would want to use um, perhaps photographs, illustrations of the conditions of the workhouse. Maybe that text above would be a, a, a document explaining it. All of that would give us a quite kind of rich classroom knowledge base for exploring these ideas. Then next lesson, or perhaps put a space in and come back to it, a quiz, of course. So what can you recall about children's working hours? Who were treated unfairly and why? And how did people suffer in the workhouses? So pretty straightforward. English and what I've done there then is I've tried to um, look to secure the students knowledge with the quiz afterwards I've begun by making it um, getting them to reflect on themselves and then this is where I would try and chunk it up so let's telescope forward to year 10 now let's just say we're studying a Christmas carol what we're going to do here is we're going to encounter knowledge in a hierarchical and horizontal sense. So going back to the idea of English is quite anarchic. So we're going to make a chunk for these young people. And to do that really nicely, just to pile something else on here, we're going to bring in, you know, one of my 
one of a, one of a really good English book, The Writing Revolution, and the famous Because But So. So I'm going to get my young people to write sentences using Because But So, and I'm going to get them to link up what we're currently studying in year 10, about Christmas Carol, with their knowledge from year seven. So my examples here are, I'm going to use the I do, we do, you do structure, and I'm going to do a form of modeling um, and classroom participation with these sentences here. So Scrooge is unwilling to provide funds to charity because he says the poor don't deserve any better. So I'm bringing in that knowledge of um, prevalent attitudes towards the poor from that time, which we saw in the year seven slides. Scrooge believes in the workhouse, but the reader would know how punishing they were. Dickens wanted to reform society, so he portrayed how the poor lost their freedom and families um, were treated. And then students could respond in different ways, judged on my, my choices as, as an expert practitioner in the room. Now, I don't think any of that is a methodology that people might find particularly life-changing or, or shocking. What I'm hoping to point out is the importance of being explicit with students about how to chunk that and how I as a practitioner or my colleagues and me as curriculum designers have reflected on the importance of integrating and causing students to integrate the knowledge that they've encountered over the curriculum that they've been on. Now, if you're not an English specialist looking at that, that might be quite interesting for you. You might think, Okay, well, that's, that's, that's how they do it. And that, I hope if you're not an English specialist, but you might uh, be working with English teachers, that's given you a bit of an insight into it. Now, for me, the next part is interesting because in my work as a senior leader, I have to work with teachers and leaders outside of my subject area on their curricula. And so thinking about how you get staff to see the way of, you want to chunk up the knowledge over time and make sure students have it is, is fascinating, but challenging because you don't know the subject area. So for this, I asked um, my brother Jake Hunt, and that's his um, Twitter handle there, to it talk me through how chunking works in MFL. And I do want to say that he would be the first person to say that his ideas here are not really just his ideas. He feels that he's been hugely influenced by um, Sorry, I just lost the, lost the signal there. Uh, <clears throat> um, and many other people who um, in MFL, really expert practitioners who, who take this chunking approach. So he talks about how he selects key vocabulary and he, um, informed by Conti and Smith, talks about ensuring students do a lot of listening, a lot of practice on chunks that can be reused over time. Um, here he talks about in Spanish, getting students to um, practice on chunks, which he would call out um, in, um, in English, getting them to write the translation in Spanish. And on paragraph four, paragraph four, he talks about a number of ways to test these chunks, delayed retrieval, chunking challenges, or narrow listening translations. Um, different approaches to make sure that, you're, that young people are practicing that key knowledge. But for him also, the, it's vital to know what those chunks are. So that's where collaborating with a team, having a, a standardized vocabulary that you work with and repeating that vocabulary with the young people is very important. Um, as you can just, just about see on the screen here, he's got an example of providing lots and lots of chunks of English, the Spanish covered up, and then he would call out the English prompt and expect to hear Spanish responses. And as an expert teacher, the MFL teacher would then be responding with feedback, identifying in the room who is succeeding well, who is not, and addressing those issues as they come up. On the next slide here, he's been able to explain about this concept called flooding the input, which is a Conti Smith approach, where students really emphasize how the chunks of grammar and vocabulary can be repeated across different topics. So students are 
um, in a more um, accelerated way, being able to um, cover the curriculum and be able to practice it more and more frequently. Now, this is a fascinating, if you're not an MFL teacher, as I'm not, it's fascinating to see how much more, um, uh, how much more, Com how, how the knowledge in MFL is very different from the knowledge in English here because without this language you simply can't move to the next stage. So quite a hierarchicized approach despite the topics being you know arrayed differently. So very interesting to talk to an MFL specialist about why they take this chunked approach. There's lots of text here, um, I won't read it all out, but there's important bits about saying that um, there are cues that are used. The cues are um, controlled by the teacher, so the teacher can move the level of challenge around based on their, their appreciation or understanding of the class, the class's responses, effectively the feedback they're getting from the students. Um, and on the next slide is just a sort of big example, really, of how the chunks can go from sentences, from words, to, to larger English sections, which then students need to create um, into, the, into the target language. So for me, this was, this was a really interesting exercise. For you as a school leader, if you're working with people outside of your subject, you might want to take this approach too and ask questions about, okay, so how is knowledge being um, repeated, recycled, chunked up and made um, efficient for, you, for learners in your subject? Because every subject has a different, different um, knowledge approach. Okay, so our last one is maths. And I'm going to try something rather fancy with the with the um, tech here, because I asked my friend Anthony if he would um, speak on this because uh, maths is not not my strongest subject. Right, so he's going to just explain his approach to chunking in maths. Or not. I'm checking. So I'm going to share my screen and I'm going to have a look at my screen. Okay, okay, so, so that, that's. So these are usable takeaways. Do you want to leave the slide there so we have a chance to finish feeding it? And um, I don't know how my sound is coming through. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just, just everyone. Um, um, like, like, um, same thing. I think I think it's quite it's quite interesting, isn't it? Because we've had we've all had like issues like this when we've been trying tech and different tools uh, in our presentations, recording stuff for the kids and uh, all kinds of things. But thank you for trying. Um, it was actually really useful to see the different ways in which we can think about the different subjects and how you would chunk. I mean, I, I, even in my two subjects with uh, English and media studies, I can, you know, these are different ways of grouping knowledge and the way I have to think about designing my curriculum is is actually a, a kind of a different exercise in each one. Um, and when you were talking about chunking and, and I suppose that links with uh, assessment, it's quite interesting to think about the, you know, this kind of big questions that can lead to those kind of, to the, what, did, what did you call that? A kind of a, a grouping of different elements. Um, and, the, and then again, I can think of it as a kind of a nesting thing in one subject, whereas yeah, it's quite yeah. different in the other. Um, so that's very, very useful. It's a useful thing to think about when, we, when we're looking at the different disciplines. Um, there was a question, but perhaps you can type the answer. <laughs> um, and then it was uh, simply, uh, you know, what would you recommend people go away and read after this presentation? You've already given us quite a few links. So if you go to Q&A at the bottom there, you can see the question and you can um, type the answer for everyone to see, or you can just share something on your screen. <laughs> Good trick. Okay, so what do we have here? We've got uh, the one that you've been talking about, the unified uh, vertical. Okay, I, I, unified, unified learning, learning model. model. 
the unified learning model, um, which I will confess I have not read, but I'm dying to go online and, and get right now. This one I would absolutely recommend. <laughs> um, it's, it's just a fantastic uh, series of essays. Um, powerful teaching. Uh, didn't quite finish it because I think it's still at school and I couldn't bring back all my books, but certainly would recommend it. It's super well organised, very, very clear, lots of fantastic advice. And you were showing Kate Jones as well. And that's Jake's, isn't it? Um, yeah, so Jake Anton's book. Um, and this is Kate Jones's uh, retrieval practice um, with lots and lots of really practical advice in it so you've got the whole theory uh, in the book but you've also got some very practical examples of how to use retrieval practice in the classroom in different subjects um, with some strategies being quite transferable uh, and some being a, a bit more subject specific so it's a very very useful book uh, I certainly recommended it to quite a lot of the uh, new teachers, early career teachers. Um, okay, <laughs> so that's quite a list, isn't it? And I'm so sorry, G, that uh, the, the sound went, went a bit um, funny there. Um, but certainly another lovely session to, to have this week when we thought about, you know, some, some of the curriculum thinking. So I don't know if people managed to listen to the other two sessions this week, but, but we've certainly had lots of different angles and, and I I think the, the current threat is that uh, we cannot forget uh, the, you know, the, the subjects as disciplines and they are very different, the organisation and the way you go about talking to your leaders about those subjects has got to be informed by some understanding of the different ways in which the knowledge is organised, uh, not just the knowledge but also the skills attached to uh, you know, that knowledge in order to apply that knowledge in different ways. So um, that has been really quite, quite enlightening. Um, and I hope everyone that you've enjoyed those three sessions. So if you haven't had a chance to catch them all, um, the first two are already on, on our YouTube playlist. And we'll make sure that we tidy up the end of this session. And that we uh, perhaps would you would you mind sharing the slides as well, Jude, so we could link those to the <laughs> to the YouTube um, uh, video. And so everyone can just refer back. There were a few links as well. And you mentioned another webinar by Ambition Institute, which I haven't seen yet, but I'm, I'm looking forward to this one. Thank you so much for all the advice and all the knowledge there. Uh, have a lovely day. Yeah, we could hear that. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much, everybody. Thank you. Thank you, Jude. Have a great day. And everyone, we are um, gearing up for the final session in this current programme of Research at Home. So tomorrow we've got a beautiful session that's been planned for you. Um, and I'm really, really looking forward to it. It will be referencing uh, Vivian Robinson's work quite a bit, uh, quite, quite a bit, sorry. Um, so uh, I think it's one not to be missed. Um, from next week, we will uh, resurrect some of the Red Loom sessions that a lot of people have been asking us to share again. So we will try and organize that uh, for the next two weeks. Um, have a great day. Thank you very much for joining us. Bye-bye. <laughs>